Hello friends, my name is Shalok Mishra and I once again welcome you on my channel on YouTube. So today we are going to discuss how to interpret a poem in the right way. Or you can interpret a poem anyway. For example, if uh, the poet says night, you can prove he is saying day or if the poet says day, you can prove he is saying night. So it's all up to you but there are certain practices that are accepted universally. There are certain interpretations of the poem that critics universally agree. For example, you can interpret the Westland only in a certain way because T.S. Eliot has already provided you with some information. And then you can interpret a poem by Wordsworth only in a certain way because critics before you have already done that. But there are certain poems which are still open to interpretation and to reach to a conclusive point, to reach to a point where you think this is, this may be the right interpretation or this may be the right message that the poet wants to communicate through the poem and also the person who is examining your copy or the person who is sitting next to you, he or she may agree. So that point of agreement is or we can say a universally acknowledged or a universally recognized interpretation of a poem. The question is how to reach to that point, how to reach to an interpretation that I agree, the poem agrees, the poet might be agreeing and others also agree. How do we reach that conclusive interpretation of a poem? So in this video, we are going to take a look on the methods that will help us reaching that agreeable point of interpretation. So follow through. Okay, so let's talk about a poem, a sample poem or an example poem and we'll interpret it. Try to find the best and agreeable interpretation. Try to find the conclusive point that you agree, I agree and anyone else who observes this process agrees. So what do we do first of all when we are given a poem and we are tasked that you should understand this poem and you should interpret this poem the right way. So the first step that you need to do is casually read the poem. Not in fact too casually just read the given poem once with free mind you don't have to have any pressure you don't have to have anything about the poet or the age or the collection of poetry nothing you just go through the given text once for example we have picked up this poem this is the golden treasury and this is dh lawrence's poem sorrow so, we will be going to interpret D.S. Lawrence's poem, Sorrow. The first, the first thing that we need to do is, we should go through the text once with an open and free mind to find what might be hiding behind the lines, between the lines and in the lines. So, we go through the text once. So, this is the text. If you have this book, you can find it there. I'll be reading it. Why does the thin grey strand floating up from the forgotten cigarette between my fingers? Why does it trouble me? The second stanza. Ah, you will understand when I carried my mother downstairs a few times only at the beginning of her soft foot melody. The final stanza, I should find for a reprimand to my gaiety a few long gray hairs on the breast of my coat and one by one I watched them float up the dark chimney. So, if you have observed the given text carefully, the title, the text, these two things together make a sentimental, a sorrowful, a disappointing, a sad scenario. And 
the poet might be describing something unpleasant and this smells of someone's death. In this case, this smells like the poet might have lost his mother recently. Do you get it? So once you go through the text, you will get some idea about the poem, some idea that might be the cause behind the process of poetry, the reason why the poet could have written the given poem. So the first read gives you enough fuel to carry on. The second thing that you need to do in order to interpret a given poem the right way is finding the common theme that binds all the stanchas together. Something that starts in the first line or right with the title and goes on until the poem ends. So in this case, what might be the common theme? So this is something you need to find. And for that, you may need to go through the poem's text once more, maybe one more time, maybe thrice, or if the need be, maybe one more time. So find out the common thread that binds the poem together. In this case, if we go through the poem Sorrow by D.H. Lawrence once more, we can easily find that sadness, memory, recollection, sense of separation or loss runs through the stanchas right from the beginning to the end. And then finally, we may move to the final step, ascribing or assigning meanings to the stanchas. So in the first stanza, we might surmise that the poet is trying to remember something. So he clearly mentions, floating up from the forgotten cigarette between my fingers, why does it trouble me? So the poet might be remembering something, some memory that might be troubling him or the memory that might be associated with his bereaved relative, in this case, mother. In the second stanza, the poet may be questioning or may be trying to find association with his readers when he asks, ah, you will understand when I carried my mother downstairs a few times only at the beginning of a soft foot melody. The poet's mother might be ill, she might be in pains, in trouble, in ailment, and the poet tries to find common cause, the association with his readers. He might be trying to invoke the sentiments in the readers. Do you remember losing someone? Do you remember being with someone in pain, in ailment, in illness, in disease? And then in the final stanza of the poem, the poet may be revealing everything. This may be the place or the point where the poet tells, see, this is the region of my ailment, of my sufferings, of my troubling memories. I should find for a reprimand to my gaiety a few long grey hairs on the breast of my coat and one by one I watched them float up the dark chimney. So this may be the final act, the act of letting someone go and then being with memory to recollect to remember and to find the connection that may be lost with the person in body but still continues with the person in someone's heart or someone's memory and this might make up 
a conclusive interpretation of the poem Sorrow by D.H. Lawrence. So this can be applied in case of any poem. Most of the times, shorter poems, because shorter poems have three, four, five, six, seven stanzas, or maybe 20 lines, 30 lines, 40 lines maximum in case of uh, um, medium-sized poems like Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard or other poems by Wordsworth that may run up to 40 or 50 lines. But in most of the cases, shorter poems like sonnets or 10 lines poem, 20 lines poem, four, uh, 14, 15 lines poem, five or six stanzas poem, you can easily apply this method. Go through the text in the first step, casually go through the text without being worried about the poet's stature, the age in which the poem might have been produced, the mental state, the physical state or the political state of that particular age. Anything about the poet, about the poem or about the age or about the literature of that particular period, leave everything behind. In the first go, you have to be with the text only, like be the lemon juice of scriptures, as T.S. Eliot might have called the school of the practical criticism people. So just go through the text, the text only. In the second go, try to find the common thread or the common cause that may connect the poem from the top to the bottom, from the beginning to the end. And in the final go, try to ascribe or assign meanings to the stanzas in the best possible way. And then you will have an interpretation of the poem that may be agreeable. And do remember, you don't have to worry because no poem can have a conclusive interpretation. Poems are up for interpretation all the time. If your professor says this is the interpretation of the poem, he or she is wrong. If you say like I have found the conclusive, not seemingly conclusive, but the conclusive interpretation of a poem, you are wrong. If I say so, like this is the only way the poem can be interpreted, I am wrong. No poem can be finally interpreted. It is always open for interpretations, for suggestions, for ideas, for new findings. Unless you know the poet personally, you are the poet, the poet may have dialed you, hello, this is the interpretation, go with that. Or the poet may have supplied you with elements that may help you in interpreting the poem. That was the case in T.S. Eliot's The Westland. He has supplied with notes as well. So it happens only rarely. Otherwise, a poem is always open to interpretations. So you don't have to worry about your interpretation being wrong or maybe be going south, maybe going too far from the actual, the possibly actual interpretation. You just have to find out your opinions, your best effort of interpreting a poem. And that is right. If you can bring an idea home, find the common thread, the common thing that goes on right from the top to the bottom and describe the best possible meanings. And you do have an interpretation. So this was it for the day. Before I wrap things up, just let me summarize the first step of interpreting any poem the best possible way each going through the text go through the text free of any burden in your mind just the, just the text and you go through the text the first step second step is go through the text once twice thrice or four times to find the common thread the common theme that binds the poem together in the final step you have to assign meanings to the lines, to the stanzas or to the sections of a given poem. And then you will have your interpretation ready. So that's it. So this is it for the day and I'll be back with more videos very soon. All the best, do good, happy time. Thank you.